Who Killed Julie is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is highly advised. This episode of Who Killed Julie is brought to you by my new book, Novel Idea to Podcast, How to Sell More Books Through Podcasting. Available on Amazon now. I'm so lucky. After everything, everything that Tony did to me, all the turmoil and heartbreak, all that crap we put on the boys, I finally done it. I finally found someone who cares, and treats me like I want to be treated. I'm finally a priority in someone's life. God, he's so charming and caring and sexy. Julie's Journal, March 6, 2013. Life can be like a hall of mirrors, in the sense that we spend so much of our time conforming to standards established by other people in order to find the success we desire, only to realize that we're not happy playing that role. So, after a while, we try to recapture the spirit of who we used to be, the person, the us, we used to love, the one we weren't ashamed to face in the mirror. Sometimes we rediscover it. Sometimes we don't. But along the way, as we're trying to find ourselves, we realize that life doesn't make allowances for recaptured youth. The world expects us to act a certain way, to do certain things, to say certain things, And if we step outside those parameters that have been firmly established and reinforced through social norms, we face backlash. Usually, that backlash comes in the form of being ostracized by coworkers, friends, even family. When we push societal boundaries for the roles we've assumed, when we don't act the way an accountant should, a youth coach should, a mother should, people, arbiters of the norm, react. And those reactions tend to be strong and hold great sway with the community at large. So we do what we need to do in order to survive. We construct our hall of mirrors, putting the right bend in the frame, angling them to cover just the right spot to mislead people's attention, to get them focused on what we want them to see so that they don't recognize the hidden shapes moving in the background. The real us. Julie McLemore's life was like a hall of mirrors. It had to be. It was the only way she could survive. I'm Emerald Johnson, and this is the sixth episode of Who Killed Julie? Caleb Haskins will be looked at by some of you as a rapist. Nothing more, nothing less. Others will see the complexity that is sexual assault, and you'll see why that label is undeserved. You won't dismiss him or his actions with the wave of a hand or the brevity of an ignorant thought. You'll treat him as fairly as he deserves to be treated. And I don't think he would have asked for anything more. Trust me, there's nothing you can say or do that'll hurt him more than he'd already hurt himself. Caleb Haskings is Caleb Haskings' worst enemy. Stanford Wilson was his second worst. I've shared most of Caleb's story already, and in honesty, he was a huge part of Julie's life. For a long while, he was all Julie had or cared about having. But he wasn't the only man in her life I need to tell you about. I struggled with what to do with some of the information I came across, From conversations to everything I read in papers, blogs, social media, and Julie's journal as well. I tried to talk to the people closest to her because that was where I felt I would get the best information. The most genuine details, stripped of societal norms, thrust upon a woman who struggled with so many things. 
And I think I did. I think I've set a good foundation for who Julie was, where she came from, and what made her the woman she was on the day she disappeared. But you haven't heard everything. Not even close. And that brings me to Stanford Wilson. Because I think we need to talk about him before we even try to get into how Julie and he were involved with each other. You've probably heard his name mentioned a few times in this series, and the more perceptive of you have probably questioned who he was, how he related to Julie's story, and why I've avoided bringing him up until this point. Well, there's been good reason, but the time for avoidance has passed. It's time to talk about him. Born in Ellensburg, Washington, to a middle-class family, Stanford Wilson was quite the celebrity, even when he was younger. Now, Ellensburg isn't all that remarkable. It's a city east of the Cascade Mountains, out where Washington State looks more like New Mexico or southern Utah. It's a city, if you can call it that, of about 20,000 people and 20 things to do. I cannot imagine being a teenager in a place like Ellensburg, unless you're into small town museums and craft arts being the center of your cultural exposure. Now, there are other things to do out there besides museums and crafts. I'm being a little hyperbolic. Maybe because small towns in the middle of nowhere aren't necessarily my thing. Let's just say the things they have to do out there are all of the small town variety. Central Washington University is located there. As you can guess, it's the most exciting place in a town that lost hope probably about the same time it lost the chance to be a state capital in the mid-19th century. In a place like that, you can imagine the notoriety a child with promise would receive. And that's exactly what Stanford Wilson was. Born in 1948 to a farming family, it wasn't long before Stanford separated himself from his peers academically and athletically. He was one of those rare children who seemed to have it all, the type you grew to envy on your darker days when you felt like you couldn't do anything right to appease your parents or impress your friends. <laughs> yeah, I know, he was one of those kids. But it didn't stop with his younger years. You know how some kids seem to have it all and then fade into obscurity as they approach high school graduation? But then there are some who persevere through life's distractions, lasting into college. And some, their trajectory is a lifelong journey upward. That was Stanford Wilson. He went to Georgetown and later worked internships on Capitol Hill, which led to an attractive law school application. A few years after that, armed with a degree, he found himself staying on the East Coast when those opportunities led to a staff job with a U.S. senator. That's when his career really took off. Stanford hustled and earned a lot of money, gained a lot more connections, and basically became the type of person who snapped their fingers and people jumped, all before his 40th birthday. Then he came home. Maybe it was the hustle and bustle of DC that wore him out like it does to so many others. Who knows? But there was space and opportunity back west, and a little over two decades after he left central Washington for the East Coast, Stanford Wilson found himself home again. And he was welcomed like a returning war hero. When people who aren't from Washington think about the state, they usually entertain this idea that it's a progressive leader in America. Few people think we're more progressive than, say, California, or maybe places like New York City or Boston, but that's just because those population centers have the advantage of millions of people, including a lot of younger people, crammed into relatively small spaces. Seattle is a populous area too, but the city isn't representative of Washington as a whole, especially those places east of the Cascade Mountains. What might surprise a lot of people is that Washington is a lot closer to a 50-50 split than you might imagine. Like, dangerously close to flipping to a red state on the political landscape. But since most of the population center is west of the Cascades, the state will probably remain progressive for the foreseeable future. 
a small source of frustration for all the farming communities in small towns east of the mountains. Towns just like Ellensburg. When Stanford Wilson came home, he provided hope for a frustrated people, people who felt like their voices weren't being heard, people who felt left behind, excluded from conversations happening in the state capitol. And Stanford Wilson had money, lots of money. No one knows where his fortune came from, not that they said publicly anyways, but with his brains, money, and political clout, it wasn't long before Stanford found himself moving and shaking things in Ellensburg's political landscape. He gained momentum, quickly. Within 10 years of coming home, Stanford Wilson became a hero of Washington's entire conservative-leaning population as a state senator. In him, Hundreds of thousands of Washingtonians felt like they finally had someone who could crack the code or bust down the blue door of liberal Washington politics. He had the money, notoriety, and charm to get things done. And he did. To his credit, Stanford wasn't a hypocrite. Well, not in relative terms. He was a politician, and as with anyone in a position like that, he couldn't truly avoid hypocrisy not if he wanted to remain in office. But he wasn't the type to mince words about how he felt, an endearing quality for conservative voters. And he made it very clear that he rarely enjoyed his time in the gray waste bin that is Olympia. No, seriously, he's on record as having said that. Multiple times. Always when he was back in Ellensburg, around his people, as he was known to refer to them. Stanford Wilson, at least publicly, didn't like Olympia. Didn't like the entire western half of Washington. Not its weather or its attitude toward a lot of economic and social issues. It must be the money that makes some people like that. To be so brazen in their announcements of disliking other people. To unleash the type of rhetoric that alienates those who aren't like them or don't think similarly. For the life of me, I can't figure out what else it could be. I've never thought like that. And I have, at least somewhat, a public persona and platform. But whatever the cause, Stanford Wilson ruffled feathers on the western side of the Cascades while he was fluffing them on the east side. Yet, as much as he distanced himself from his adversaries, he seemed to have a very clean political record. No one bashed him. Campaign slurs never seemed to reach him. It was like he was untouchable, even by his peers. It's pretty impressive when you think about it. I didn't know anything more about Stanford than what I saw in the news from time to time. I was basically ignorant about him until Caleb broke down that night in the hotel bar and got very, very real with me. Well, it wasn't exactly like that, but yeah. Okay, I'll fix that. Can we talk about the elephant in the room? Yeah. Yeah, we can, I guess. So, what happened in the bar in Fresno? Yeah, that. Can you start filling in the blanks? <sighs> okay, which blanks? I don't know what you don't know. For all I know, Rachel could have told you How about from your comment about killing Julie? Let's start there. Okay, fine. Listen. You know I didn't mean that literally, right? Of course. But this is for the podcast. I want you to explain to my listeners what you meant, and I want them to hear what we talked about later that night. No one's going to understand this if you don't explain it. It's important to Julie's story. It wasn't supposed to end up like this. Julie never wanted it to get out of hand. I don't even think she saw it coming. I sure didn't. It, it didn't matter that I was living back in Fresno when it got bad. I should have been there for her. I should have helped. What could you have done, though? I mean, realistically, what could you have done? I don't 
don't know. I don't know. Let's go back a little bit. What did you mean when you said that? That you killed Julie? She wouldn't have done it if it wasn't for me. It was my fault. How can you say that? Wait, don't answer that. We're actually getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, tell everyone what you're actually talking about. I'm talking about her part-time job. You're talking about her working as a stripper. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. How did she get started? Was that her idea? No, of course not. It never crossed her mind. Then why did she do it? I don't know. Why do people do half the things they do? Desperation? Necessity? Hell, fun? All I know is that she was in a really bad place at that point. Really desperate. Things weren't going well for her. Her ex was an asshole. No, that's not right. Her ex is an asshole. Julie wasn't getting any help. He wasn't around for the kids because he was all the way across the country. And honestly, even if he was here, I don't think he would have been interested in helping out in any fashion. He was like that. He just didn't care. But she was still working for the state, right? When she was stripping? Yeah, but that didn't take care of everything. Not even close. She got herself into some financial trouble and wasn't ever able to dig herself out. I tried to help when I could, but I had a family myself. And a wife who would notice if something wasn't right in your budget. <laughs> yeah, something like that. I couldn't help myself, never mind helping her, but I wanted to. I really wanted to. So she did what she needed to do. It wasn't easy, and it's not like it was a flippant decision on her part. She really struggled with it after I suggested it. Not very many people knew. But those who did were really judgmental. It, it was probably the worst rejection she could have had. People she trusted in, had faith in, people she thought cared about her and her kids, they let her down. It was absolutely disgusting. That had to be heartbreaking. So, what happened? Did you just set her up with someone? I'm sorry, I, I don't know how these things work. No, she did it mostly on her own. She did all the research. You know, one thing about her was that she was never going to ask anyone to do something she could do for herself. She was a go-getter like that. And once I suggested it, she went full bore into it. She was concerned about safety because she'd never been in a strip club before and had no idea what it was like. She was smart. <laughs> she didn't trust me, and I couldn't blame her. You've got to remember, by this time in her life, she'd already been burned by just about everyone. Betrayed is probably a better term, I guess. She was skeptical of everyone, including those who really loved her. But then she definitely wasn't the same woman I knew back in Syracuse. And yet, you still loved her. <laughs> yeah. Very much. She did well for herself. I can still remember how excited she was when she started paying down all her debt. Most of which came from that asshole, Tony. But he wasn't going to do anything about it, and she couldn't stand to see her credit being ruined any more than it already was. She never wanted it in the first place, and as soon as he walked out on her, it was something she started correcting. Not that it was easy. This, doing that, it, it was a sacrifice she knew she had to make. It's not like she was proud. And she didn't go around bragging to people about what she was doing, but she was able to feed her boys while keeping a roof over their heads, and she was able to start pulling herself out of a very deep hole. Yet people rejected her, turned their backs on her. Even Rachel? Yeah, even her. I thought they were always close. Too close not to support one another. Yeah, me too. Funny how fickle friendship can be, isn't it? I mean, I don't know what happened between the two of them, but it couldn't have been good. They didn't talk for almost two years. But you'd have to ask her about that. We're not exactly on speaking terms. Was it because of this? Yeah, in part, I think. All I know is when Julie started stripping, it caused a lot of friction between them. It's not that Rachel's a prude or anything, but she is very protective of Julie and, and knew Julie's struggles. She knew what kind of family Julie came from. So I think that was a factor for her. 
But Julie didn't care. It's not that she didn't care. She did. It broke her heart to see what was happening between her and Rachel, but she had her priorities and her kids always came first. That was the one constant with her. It didn't matter if it was Rachel or her mother or anyone else for that matter. The children always came first and she would do anything for them. I mean, come on. That's the only reason she was doing what she was doing. Okay. I get that. I get why that might be a problem for her, but I don't understand why you think that ultimately led to her disappearance and murder. Because it didn't stop at stripping. There was more. Throughout this series of Who Killed Julie, we will be partnering with Safe Place in Olympia, Washington to raise funds for their operations. Safe Place provides crucial services to survivors of domestic and sexual violence. They offer a 24-hour helpline, 24-hour emergency shelter, and sexual assault response, advocacy support groups, legal clinics, children and youth programs, prevention education, community outreach, and training. Please see the donation link in the episode notes. Help us raise as much as we possibly can for Safe Place in Olympia, Washington to serve people who need them now. Today, Olympia, Washington. Tomorrow, your city. Let's change the world. Caleb and I talked a little longer about Julie's situation at the nightclub. She only worked at one club in her entire time stripping. It was in Tacoma, about a 40-minute drive from home for Julie. That in itself was difficult for her, being that far away from her children and at that time of night. But what made it even more difficult was the fact that she had no one she could count on to help her. No family and no friends who she could be completely honest with. She was even forced to lie to the elderly neighbor who watched the boys. A theme of Julie's story, I discovered. She wrote in her journal, you know what? Hang on, let me get it. She wrote, let me see. Um, I miss the boys so much. I should be tucking them into bed, reading them bedtime stories, not Ada. I love her to death, we're lucky to have her, but it should be me. I should be there for the boys. But no, I'm almost there. I've got a plan, a hookup for a job that's gonna earn me a lot of money, like stupid amounts of money. I don't feel right, but well, it doesn't matter. It's something I need to do. A couple months. That's all it's going to take. A couple months. And then I'm finally free. She did what she had to do. I don't fault her, and I hope you won't either. She was a mother trying to get by. She did what needed to be done for her children. She did what a lot of us would do if we were in the same situation and had the same opportunities. Yet she had to be dishonest with basically everyone in her life for one reason or another. Sometimes the world isn't ready to face its own hypocrisy and that turmoil creates chaos and victims. No matter how many battles Julie won, there was always another waiting for her. Her war never ended. The darker side of Julie's story didn't stop at her working as a stripper a few nights a week. Caleb shocked even me with what he said next. You need to hear it from him. What happened next in Julie's life? So how long was she working there? I don't know, to be honest. I mean, we talked as often as we could, as often as we could get away with, you know what I mean? Yeah. I just remember mentioning it to her once. I wasn't even sure how she was going to react, but but like I said, she did whatever research she needed to do to feel comfortable, and then I sort of facilitated her getting an interview because I know some people. After that, I basically stepped away. You two fell out of touch? No. 
we stayed in touch as much as we could. I called her from time to time, and she would call me as well, but we didn't speak often enough for me to really know what was going on. Not until much later, not until it was too late. What do you mean by that? I mean, I didn't know what she was doing until she was already doing it. Caleb, I'm not sure what you're talking about. What happened next? You really don't know. No one's told you, huh? I'm not surprised. I wouldn't expect Rachel to mention it, and it's not like you can get in touch with either Roderick or Stanford. I highly doubt Walter is in any kind of mood to talk about it even now. But Julie didn't stop at stripping. What do you mean? Where do you go after that? You cannot be telling me that she got into prostitution. Are you? No, but close. She started escorting. What? How? I don't know. The same way I imagine anyone does. This is the age of the internet, after all. It's not that difficult to find anything you want. All I know is we hadn't talked for a few months, so I decided to check in with her. She let me know she was doing really well. I believed it. I could hear it in her voice. Something was different. I can't put my finger on it, but I'm sure you've been there, too. You've had some sort of stress, some serious pressure in your life, and then one day it's resolved. And you feel like you could literally fly, right? I think that's where she was at that point. And I think it's because those two jobs allowed her to free herself. How did she get away with it? How did no one find out she was escorting? Because Julie was smart. She knew that if anyone found out what she was doing, they'd be devastated and there'd be problems for her. That's the thing with people, isn't it? They want to be happy for you, want to celebrate your successes, but they don't necessarily want to know how you became successful. Julie climbing out of debt and starting to provide a future for her sons was definitely a success as far as she was concerned. Hell, it was a success to Angela and Walter as well. Angela, especially, she'd always been so hard on Julie, letting her know each time she fell down just how much of a failure she was, that she, yet again, wasted a promise. That's crazy. Of course, Julie wasn't a failure. If anything, she was the example, but Angela never saw that, never cared to. I don't... I don't even know if she can see it now. And I'm not really interested to find out, actually. I have no desire to ever talk to that woman again. It seems like Angela has that effect on a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could say that. So, I'm still trying to understand this. How does all this tie back to your claims that you're responsible for her death? Because I think that's where she met her murderer. It was at her stripping job that Julie met Stanford Wilson. Apparently, the prim and proper conservative leader of central Washington wasn't as prim and proper as his public image would like to convey. He may not have enjoyed having to make constant trips to Olympia to help build the law that governed the lives of millions of Washingtonians, but according to Caleb, Stanford enjoyed one aspect of coming here for Senate sessions. And that was the opportunity to get away from his private life in Ellensburg and enjoy the secret life he had on the western side of the Cascadia Range. The strange thing about strip clubs in this day and age is that they still carry a stigma. No one wants them in their neighborhoods, and everyone denies that they go to them. Yet, strip clubs still exist. They still do good business. They still make a lot of money. The people from all walks of life patron them, but no one will admit to it. At least very few do, and definitely not state senators. Stanford Wilson most definitely never admitted it, at least what I could find in public record. Not that I expected to find anything, but according to Caleb, that's exactly where Stanford and Julie cross paths. I went back into Julie's journal and did some skimming and found a lot of entries that mentioned him. A lot. What Caleb didn't mention, what I wasn't able to include in that last discussion, 
was that he and Julie started having a very heated affair again in 2011. I don't think any of you are shocked by that revelation, but it was important to the story, and I would have hoped he'd come clean about it. Caleb was married at the time, of course, and Julie was already a single mother and knew that he was married. They saw each other as often as they could, often sneaking weekend visits under the pretenses of having to work on a special project or, in Julie's case, a state budget issue. Caleb would lie to his wife just as much as Julie lied to her mother and father so they'd babysit the boys for the weekend when Ada couldn't do it. It couldn't have been easy. Long-distance relationships rarely are. Wanting to be with Julie meant that Caleb had to find reasons to get out of Fresno and up to Olympia. Fortunately for him and Julie, the company he worked for is headquartered in Tacoma, so his wife was never suspicious of his reasons to fly up here every few weeks and, as repulsive as it is, he had enough of her trust that she never questioned him. So, month after month, Caleb flew to Seattle for business. And that business included spending every waking moment with the woman he truly loved, behind the back of the woman he claimed he loved. As with all things matter of the heart, these things are complex. Assigning blame won't bring her back. The fact is, Julie and Caleb had an ongoing affair for the two years prior to her disappearance. It was Caleb who tried to help her as much as he could in the position he was in. And it was Caleb who first mentioned to Julie about looking at jobs at the strip club. But the rest of the story is Julie's to own. Caleb was too far away to fully understand what was happening. And no matter how often they discussed each other's lives on those short, thrilling weekend visits, they never got around to talking about the progression of her part-time work. What Caleb never knew about Julie's secret life was the same as everyone who loved her. They were all equally ignorant. I have to fully believe that Julie intended it to stay that way. You see, something changed in those months after Caleb encouraged her to look into stripping. Julie changed. Julie's financial status changed. And for the first time, Julie was able to enjoy a freedom she'd never had before. She was an adult with adult responsibilities who was no longer shackled by a lot of those requirements. She was living and she was alive, sadly, for one of the first times in her life. She was a disempowered woman who, through her own sweat and tears, rose above the very forces that insisted she fit into a certain role, a certain model. The forces that expected a single mother to comply with the edicts of other people's perspective and interest. This opportunity, this part-time job that paid her more than her full-time job, became the vehicle that set Julie toward freedom and, ultimately, toward death. That was something I needed to talk to Rachel about before I even entertained the idea of approaching the topic with Walter and Angela. So, you knew about this? Yes, I did. Yet you didn't mention it to me, but you felt okay accusing Caleb of rape. <laughs> Don't tell me Caleb's got you convinced of his innocence. And as far as this other stuff, I didn't think it was important enough for you to know about. Or you're trying to hide it from me. Just like you've been resistant to sharing Julie's full story with me all along. Why does it matter? She's gone, and you digging into this part of her life won't change that. So what if she'd stripped? According to Caleb, you weren't this cool about it when she was doing it. Seems like you had a problem with her stripping. The only problem that I have is that she wasn't safe. How do you know she wasn't safe? Don't you know how those things work? Those girls aren't safe. They can't be. All those creeps, perverts. So disgusting. Julie used to tell me what it was like. 
what it was really like, all the groping, all the times she would go out to her car after a night of work and have some scumbag waiting for her. That shit isn't safe. Do you know if she was ever assaulted at the job? No, but that doesn't mean anything. Julie hated it. Rachel, I've read her journal, her entries from that time. Nothing in there indicates she hated anything but being away from her boys. In regards to the work, I'll be honest, it seems she actually enjoyed it. No, she didn't. I'm telling you, I've read it in her own words. Are you sure you're not just projecting onto her? I can't because she's fucking dead. I understand that, Rachel, but I need you to understand that this, this entire project, it isn't about you. This is Julie's story, and I need to be honest to that. So, can you at least try to work with me? Can you be honest about who Julie was? She wasn't like that. That wasn't her. But it was. It was her. It, it just isn't right. What isn't right? Well, what she was doing. She shouldn't have been doing that. She was a mother. God damn it. What kind of mother does that? What does it matter? That's what happened, and that's the reality of the situation. You can't change it, so why spend energy worrying about it? Does it make the memory of Julie any less human? Well? No. I guess it doesn't. I can't ask you to understand it. You didn't know Julie like I did. I, fuck, you didn't know Julie at all. But that wasn't who she was. That... like that in her last years? To, to disappear? To die? To leave me with that memory? Fuck her. If it helped her get out of the situation she was in, why is it so bad? I could understand why Angela would be upset about Julie stripping, but why you? Because it didn't stop there, did it? No, it didn't fucking stop there. I told her. I fucking told her. What did you tell her, Rachel? I told her what would happen. I told her that these things always lead to bad shit. Drinking, drugs, prostitution. I warned her and she didn't fucking listen. Maybe she would still be here if she did. You can't be sure I most certainly can be, too. See, you don't get it. You have no idea what you're getting into. I warned you that you didn't need to be poking around. You could have just written some human interest piece. But you didn't listen. You just kept poking and poking and poking. And now you're getting into territory you don't need to be in. Just walk the fuck away. It's already too late for Julie. Nothing you can write is going to help. Rachel was being Rachel, protective of Julie to a fault. It was time to see where I could get with Angela. I wasn't looking forward to it, but that's the sacrifice we make, right? I'm sorry to drop in on you like this. Oh, don't worry about it. What did you need? Do you have time? I'd like to discuss something I found about Julie. I want to get your thoughts on it. Uh, we can talk here. I... I'd rather not. It's sort of sensitive. Oh, don't bother with that. What is it? I've been told about a lot of things that happened to Julie while she was at Syracuse. A lot of troubling things that you haven't mentioned, so I'm wondering how much you know about Julie's experience from that time. I know enough. Yes, I understand that, but do you know everything, and you're just holding it back? Of course I know everything. I'm her mother. Okay, then what are your thoughts on why Julie wasn't honest with you? What are you talking about? 
why weren't you up front with me about the assaults? I still have no idea how much you know or don't know. It makes it difficult to frame everything else you're telling me. I... Those things shouldn't be spoken of. Why? It's not proper. And don't you dare be bringing the devil's business into my home. Angela, I'm trying to talk to you about what happened to your daughter. It's not right. It's just not right. That's... I've prayed and prayed about that. I've asked the Lord to forgive Julie. My prayers have been answered and I've moved on. The Lord had a plan for her. So you knew at least something and you still won't tell me. I told you. I prayed about her, for her. That's all that was needed. Have you ever read Julie's journal? Her, her what? Her journal. She kept one. Did you know that? I, uh, I didn't. Maybe, maybe when she was a child. No, as an adult. She kept a journal up until the time she disappeared. H how do you know that? Because I have it. Where did you get that from? Walter gave it to me. He thought I needed to see what Julie wrote. Let's, let's go inside. You don't have children, do you? No, I don't. Been married? No, striking out in the romance department. Oh, why is that? Just not something I'm interested in at the moment. I see. In my day, a woman's goal for her life, at least where I grew up, was to marry a nice boy who would turn into a good man and provide. That's all we had to look forward to, and it was every little girl's dream to be just like her mother. All of our mothers were housewives, every single one of them. That was the extent of our ambition. Now, I understand that may have just been the situation I was born into, and not necessarily what the rest of the world would appreciate. I was never one for the big city or, or big city thinking. I preferred the simple life. A nice, quiet, simple way of living. Everyone knew who everyone was. Men were men, women were women. The way the Lord intended, that's the way we lived. And that's the way we liked it. You can imagine that Julie was a challenge for me then. <laughs> I'll be honest. I had a hard time with her. Even from early on in her life, she was difficult. But I loved her all the same. I loved her with all of my heart. But I didn't understand a lot of what she did. Even, even now, I don't understand what happened to her. How could she let that happen? Are we talking about the problems at school? Yes. If she, if she had been behaving, those types of things wouldn't have happened. Angela, that's not how any of this works. Julie isn't at fault for what happened to her. Good girls don't get raped, Emerald. That happens to good girls all the time. The problem is that the good girls aren't allowed to talk about it, either out of internal guilt or external pressure. They're forced to be quiet. It's one of the uglier realities of sexual assault. Every single year, there are tens of thousands of victims who never report what happened to them out of fear of what will happen after they come forward. People don't believe them, and a lot of times the perpetrator is the one who's championed. That's the reality of it, and it's been the reality of it. It's the very reason why a lot of young women are conditioned to remain silent even before something happens, because they know what the reaction will be, and they'll do anything to avoid it. What happened to Julie is not her fault. I want you to understand that so you can move on. She can't be blamed for the decisions and actions of others. If if she had just gone to church, if she had just hung around with the right kind of crowd, not those. This stuff happens in all crowds, Angela, even the religious. 
As a culture, we haven't gotten to the place where we can have honest discussions about sexual assault. But no one is immune to it. Can I ask you something? Yes, I guess. Do you ever regret the relationship you had with her? I'm sorry? If you could turn back time, would you have done things differently so that you were closer to her? I was close to my daughter, Miss Johnson, and I don't appreciate you saying otherwise. Yet, there are so many things about our life that you didn't know until later. Things you might still not know. Why is that? There, there are things that a mother and daughter shouldn't discuss. What Julie, what she did with her life, that's not my business. That's between her and God. I just hope she made peace with him before. Do you think she needed you? That she would have preferred to have you in her life? To talk about these things, about the struggles. We talked. The real shame about what happened between Julie and her mother is that they will never get resolution. I didn't like Angela. I think that's apparent. But I did feel for her. I feel for any mother who's lost a child, but especially those who will never be able to make amends. I think that's the real tragedy for Angela. That she will never be able to hold Julie in her arms again and have all those conversations that she wasn't willing to have when Julie was alive. Julie's story is full of tragedy and heartache. It's a story of a woman scorned by so many people throughout her life. The story of a beautiful woman with a beautiful heart who wanted to love and be loved. And in each turn in life, she faced challenges. Each time she found her escape, another roadblock was placed in front of her. Yet, she kept pressing on. She always pressed on. Her story doesn't end here though. We have one more episode to go in Julie's story. In that episode, I'll wrap up the details of her final days. I hope you'll join me. Join me in honoring an imperfect woman who spent her life living in a hall of mirrors. Be sure to tune in two weeks from now for the seventh and final installment of Julie's story. You've been listening to Who Killed Julie? I'm Emerald Johnson. Thank you for listening, and, as always, keep questioning. Hey, fans of Who Killed Julie, Paul Sading, with a quick message before we get to the credits. This is almost it. We only have one more episode to go. If you want to hear the continuation of this series, if you want to find out what next story Emerald Johnson would like to tell, then become a patron today. In the future, we're going to launch a fundraiser sometime in later 2019, but that means that we're already looking at 2020 before the next story in this series drops. If you want to help us get there quickly and start working on it immediately, head over to patreon.com forward slash Paul Sating, P-A-U-L-S-A-T-I-N-G, and become a patron today. As soon as we hit that funding level for Who Killed Julie? We'll begin. Now let's get to the credits. Who Killed Julie is written and edited by Paul Sading. You can find more about me and my books and other audio drama podcasts, my writing podcast, over at paulsading.com. It is produced and sound designed by the excellent Dog and Pony Studios in Las Vegas, Nevada. They are also the company that produced the second season of Subject Found. You can find them at dogandponystudios.net. Emerald Johnson was played by the one and only, the absolutely wonderful and highly talented audiobook narrator, Ashley Litzy. You can find more about Ashley, her work, and her services over at deepcurvesahead.com. Angela Morrison was Robin Siegerman. You can find Robin and her books over at robinsegerman.com. 
Rachel Leonard is the one and only Rihanna McAfee. You can find her on twitter.com forward slash re McAfee. John McLean of Dog and Pony Studios played Walter McLemore. You can find him at dogandponystudios.net. Christopher Rocco, Olympia based actor, played Caleb Haskins. You can find Caleb's live performances by checking out the schedule at oletheater.com. And Lauren Wisniewski played the customer in episode two. She's a wonderful voice actor who you can find at lawofalltrades.wordpress.com. I want to give a special thanks to Amy Joy Hilt, who beta read for this podcast, volunteered her services, and really helped me tweak it to make sure that it was ready and appropriate for the material. Amy is a teacher in England and sometimes writer, and I want to thank Amy for her help. This show wouldn't have been what it is without her. If you want to find more about my stories, if you want exclusive stories, if you want insights, special posts, live messaging, early and exclusive access, stories that no one else is going to hear, and you really like what I'm doing with Who Killed Julie, you want to see the second part of this series happen, become a patron. Go over to patreon.com forward slash pulsating, pick a reward level that works for your budget, and the exclusives that you want, and help me start funding the next show in this series. You can also find this show, paulsating.com forward slash who dash killed dash Julie, where you can find all of the wonderful actor bios. It's on Libsyn, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Play. The show is also on Facebook and Twitter, as am I. You can find me at Paul Sating or at Who Killed Julie. The artwork is done by the wonderful Kessie Rolinicki, who does all of my book covers and podcast covers. And of course, that music that is absolutely perfect for this show was done by none other than John Eric de Guzman of Dog and Pony Studios. Thank you for your download and your listen. Please tell a friend about the show. Please help us spread this important message, this important story, Julie's story, the story of us. Music in these credits is provided by Richard Temple.